Hello and welcome to another Digital Foundry developer interview. This time I have a very special guest joining me to talk about, I guess, the big game of this past week, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Uh, to discuss it, I am joined by the one and only Mike Fitzgerald from Insomniac. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. You're overseeing the tech there. You're like the tech director, I guess, over at Insomniac. Is that right? Yeah, I'm the director of the core technology group. So we are an engine and tools and technical art team that uh, helps all the different projects going on and gets to have our fingers in every every project uh -huh. and um, work on that through line of technology that goes from game to game. Perfect. So uh, obviously Ratchet & Clank is out this week. Uh, it reviewed very well, so congratulations to you and the team. That's, that's really excellent news. And it looks excellent. And uh, there's some really impressive stuff in there. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you today because uh, as far as next generation games go, this is definitely at the top of the pack. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting things, and where we should probably start, is talking about everything surrounding the SSD and loading all these assets into RAM the way you do. Because one of the key features in this is that you can sort of switch between dimensions at various points during the game. Uh, sometimes it uses portals, sometimes you're actually hitting these crystals to swap dimensions. Um, but I think a lot of people are curious to learn more about both how this works, like when this idea came into the picture, like just some of the details behind this technique. Sure. Um, I think pretty early on when we learned that the console would have some faster storage, um, I mean, we were excited to hear it. De dealing with the spinning hard drives in the older consoles is always you know, a huge struggle and something to optimize around tremendously. And so, you know, off the bat, getting a device that has you know, a couple orders of magnitude faster read speeds opens up a lot of doors. So um, along with the goal to introduce some new players, um, you know, have a smooth intro to the franchise, that idea of multiple dimensions and new characters who are meeting and introducing each other uh, worked pretty nicely. And so it, it came from there. Um, I think over the course of development though, that idea of, okay, we have an SSD, we can do stuff faster and go faster. Um, we really surprised ourselves, the hardware surprised us as to how fast we could actually do this stuff past just having, yeah. you know, a faster SSD. There's all this other, um, you know, IO hardware and pipeline around it that lets us do more and more ridiculous things. So during development, it was, uh, you know, oh, we can load a level in a few seconds. Oh, I think we can do it in one second. Oh, I think we can do it in a half a second, you know, and so it wasn't just we can issue requests to this faster drive it's we can um, batch up our requests and send them out it will manage and prioritize them itself we can you know think about prepping things in memory ready formats because then they can just be slapped right into the unified memory and be used immediately so things like that that let us um you know push it further and further Ah, oh, so that almost sounds like sort of the memory mapping technique you would use back in the day with like cartridge-based systems where you have the storage, you can essentially read into it directly. So the way you're packaging the data files is in such a way that you can actually just bring that right over to memory and immediately start using it in RAM uh, within like less than a second then. Yeah, I think, I think pretty quickly our constraint changed from, oh, uh, we can't get the data off the drive fast enough to... Uh, our engine is too slow at processing this data we got off the drive. Like we can't keep up with it. And so That's interesting. it's about thinking about how we issue requests, about when we load versus unload things, about um, yeah, the, ex the exact data we package it in and not caring a little less about making it small. That was, that was the game on the PS4 is make the data as small as you can because then you get better bandwidth reading, you know, better effective bandwidth getting it off the drive. And now it's Oh, there's some built-in hardware compression that takes care of that for you. You should just put it on there in a format that lets you use it as fast as you can. Uh -huh. That's as interesting. soon as it appears. So flipping that on its head and finding ways to take advantage of that for sort of what we got to do for this project. Okay, so I guess then, like, so for instance, you're designing these levels where you're switching between dimensions mid-stage. Um, I mean, what roughly are we looking at in terms of like the data size of like a typical stage? Like, like let's say Blizzard Prime, you have both the, the outer space version and then you have sort of the lived in version. Like, how does that compare? Well, so both of those are full quality, you know, dense levels. So each one will take up all of the available 
memory we have. Wow, okay, so you're basically filling your memory right away when one of those levels is loaded. Yeah, and you know, we rely on uh, prioritization of things in the scene, things that are close need their high mips and that needs to come in and things that are far don't need that stuff. And so the whole level is not resident in oh, memory sure. at the same time, of course, yeah. but it's, um, each is treated as a full quality level. It doesn't need to reserve any space for the other one to stay available so you can switch back and forth. We're really pulling everything we need to render the next frame off the drive. Uh, I think that, that, and that's kind of the fundamental difference, I guess. Like we've seen some games try switching things before and it's usually, it's built, the map is built in such a way that you have most of what you need resident in memory and then you're able to toggle back and forth. But by pulling this from the drive, this is allowing you to, I assume, have much larger, more complex scenes, which, well, we can see here in the game itself, uh, which is really interesting, I would say. So you are just pulling each chunk of level from the drive every time you need to access that level. Yeah, and I would say that, that let our designers not overthink it too much, right? They can just, instead of creating this intense, uh, okay, I can load this tiny piece from a level if I construct it just the right way and put it this way and that way and reserve memory and make sure it's not too complicated. They can just say, uh, yeah, I want to go from this spot in this level to this spot in this level. And we can just sort of naively handle something that sounds ridiculous like that. Um, but through, you know, unload the old one, load the new one. Okay, you're in the new spot, ready to go. And then I guess we should also talk about the portals themselves and also things like the cross wipes that are in there where you're effectively displaying two different levels at once during these sequences. But I guess in this case, uh, you actually do need to load two sets of data. Like how, how exactly are you managing this? And are you like actively rendering these two viewports at the same time in full quality and everything? Yes, yeah, so there's two good examples. Okay. Or two examples of this that are particularly interesting. One is, uh, one's the cross wipes, you know, you can yeah. tell that's two full frame scenes and the other is um, the pocket dimension portals in the worlds that open up and you can just walk right through um, or actually even the the tether ones which show the same space you're in that sort of zip you across the oh, battlefield right, sure. that's another rendered it's a little more subtle but it's another rendered view of the same place um, those sort of leverage the same set of techniques there uh, and that was a bunch of work put into one, from an optimization standpoint, make sure you don't render the scene, any of the scene that's behind the portal. That's a waste. We don't have time yeah, of for, course. for that. Use the portal don't to a render, clue, yes. <laughs> yeah, and don't render anything uh, within the portal that would be you know, not visible through it. Okay, be very, very uh, conservative about that. And then um, the ch real one of the real challenges there was maintaining motion blur, um, depth of field, uh, all the TA, the, the motion vectors that you need per pixel per frame for our anti aliasing to work well, making sure those are perspective correct through the portal, uh, making sure the atmosphere back there is reverse tone mapped from the main scene's atmosphere so that when the main scene is then processed, you see something that looks correct, oh, yeah. uh, all that kind of stuff. And then of course, the moment you, the moment you walk through it, so the pocket dimension ones, for example, you can walk around the portal, not go th through it. So it doesn't exist. That space doesn't exist there. It exists in the game world, say, two miles away, far away okay. behind a mountain where you'd never see it, something like that. OK, got it. As soon as you walk through, we need to take your character, teleport them two miles away, mm -hmm. not have any of their physics respond to that, not have um, any of the motion blur or controls respond to that. For a while, your camera is still on this side of the portal, three miles away from uh, where the character is, and yet the right stick still has to behave uh, correctly. And at the moment the character goes through the portal, um, we need to then transition that to the main scene in a completely seamless way. Oh yeah, and it is really seamless. I mean, in, in my video, I tried walking around like very close, right around one of the portals in slow motion, kind of spinning the camera, trying to break it, and it's pretty bulletproof. It, it does feel like you can mess around with it without seeing any uh, unwanted artifacts. So that's really cool. I'll say we solved that problem first and then got to leverage it to do those 
screen wipes and and uh, you know um, there's one shot it's in our launch trailer where Ratchet and Rivet are on separate sides of the screen in different dimensions oh, yeah, talking that, at the same cool. time that's really cool yeah and and those are cool you know really cinematic techniques that we haven't been able to do before that all the same portal technology lets us uh lets us do that's really really cool um so yeah i mean that's kind of the gist then of what you guys were doing with the ssd and everything and it's obviously uh it's really nice to hear that it does sort of free up the designers it sounds like so they can sort of like unleash their creativity in new ways uh which we definitely do see in the game i think so that's that's really interesting um is there anything else you want to say about this technology before we move on to the next big thing i'll just say that we've got a ways to go in terms of leveraging it completely um there's a lot of features there there's still some uh still some performance left on the table that i don't think we're comfortable leaving there and so i think going forward we'll be trying to you know get stuff off disk even even faster conceivably this could also mean like for instance like super fast traversal across a world like you could theoretically go from like one side of the world to the other without like having to make a jump cut you think like loading data so fast you could just like rocket across a map um i would say so i mean if you look at raw not even raw number if you look at the effective bandwidth we can get through it like i, I think i said it, it's a couple orders of magnitude more than it was off the spinning drive of the of uh, the ps4 sure, yeah. and so for us it's about uh can we handle getting that much data that fast from an engine standpoint and getting it ready to use cool okay uh well the other big technical feature and this one um i i love this this is you, you guys have hardware accelerated ray tracing in there so ray trace reflections they are used prominently throughout the game uh and often in more creative ways than the you know the natural city environment of spider-man there's a lot of curved glass and weird shapes that are reflective and uh I want to talk about all that, but one of the first things I want to ask you about is, so when we first got the review code, the reflections were basically quarter resolution, which is pretty much how it was in Spider-Man, and that's what I expected. And then comes along this update, and all of a sudden, bam, now the reflections are like uh, reconstructed, but like native pixel counts matching whatever the scene is being rendered at, which is kind of an absurd optimization. Like, that's a huge amount of improvement. Can you talk about like how you guys were able to pull that much more performance out of the ray tracing side of things? There's a few really talented folks on that team <laughs> doing awesome work. Abdul and Durant, shout out. Um, I think there was a, a moment of, you know, just trying different things towards the end of the game, trying out, you know, updating different sets of pixels at different times. So we have sort of a checkerboarded technique in there now. Um, there's a lot of uh, reprojection from from previous scenes to you know the reflections are pretty pretty stable you're looking at a static mm -hmm. scene in a static for the most part static object from a, a perspective that's not moving a ton and so if you can retain the data from the last frame in a good way use it the next frame you can you can get a checkerboard to look pretty good um for so sure. there's a lot of yeah how do we use this pixel in the reflection, we need to know not just where the object it's reflecting from is, but also off the bounce space where the original one is and how that would move. And if we can get all that just right, you know, and the, most of the reflections are slightly blurred or. Um, yeah, the ru the roughness of the material as well helps a lot there. That's that's cool. So, I mean, are you, so even with all those like reprojection techniques and reconstruction going on, are you still, um, I mean, What's like what's what's the the ray count increase from like what it was to what it is now? I mean, did you actually increase the ray count? I'm not sure it in increased dramatically, actually. Like really, maybe on the twenty percent. Okay. Scale. It was more about um, what you did with them. You know, yeah, what we did with it and how we could. I mean, certainly, we're doing doing that reprojection takes time and performance. So sure, the technique itself had some expense to it that we needed to to, to manage if, if even if it wasn't just shooting more rays sure to more data. but still yeah the, the the overhead cost of the reprojection combined with like 20 percent more rays or so that's still that's a it's a significant gain um, we found headroom in um 
how we, you know, how we constructed the scene. Most of this comes from getting the 60 frames per second, the performance RT mode oh, working. <laughs> so I see, I it's see. a lot of, uh, we have to do a lot of optimization to get this to the level of stability that, you know, we like to ship with our games. And um, hey, we we found some, some headroom here. Oh, this made the 30 frames per second mode, you know, sit at a full 4K more, more often than it did before. It gives us room to do this type of checkerboarding or reprojection stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that last push to get the performance modes all functional gave us some some headroom to use for Ray So from an artist's perspective, then, you still have to worry about uh, using non-ray trace reflections. So there's still the fallback of, you know, you have your cube maps in there, I guess, generated by probes. You have the SSR layer as well. Uh, and this all applies to the, to the normal performance mode. Uh, but it is interesting to see how the the material response does seem to differ significantly in some areas. Like, does this lot? Uh, I guess it's in the lava area around Blizzard Prime. Uh, there's like this stone-like material where, when you're using ray tracing, uh, the reflection itself sort of disperses out across the surface, whereas with SSR, it just has a very glossy, sharp, reflective look. Uh, I am curious to know a little bit about like the process there of balancing those two looks and like how it is for the artists to work in this way and uh, whether you think it's like maybe in the future just be like, uh, we're, let's just go all ray tracing. <laughs> I think there's definitely a future where we go all ray tracing. Um, you know, we've gotten more confident in our ability to deliver those 60 frames per second modes with, with the ray tracing feature. And I think, well, we'll be, you know, we'll pay attention to what modes people use in this game and right, right. Uh, what they care about and prioritize. And that'll help us figure out what we lean into in the future and the types of things we want to focus on. So. Although at the same time, uh, I, I comment in another video, uh, you guys are using the 120 hertz output mode. Is there any theoretical possibility of actually reaching 120 frames per second, let's say without ray tracing? There are some spots in our game that you could totally run at 120 frames Per second so the one of the constraints on the gpu side we have some flexibility we can turn sure. off ray tracing we can um drop the resolution down we can you know use use lower resolution effects for fog or whatever you know all sorts of kind of stuff um it's the cpu side and all the gameplay that needs to happen where you run up against more concrete walls of what you can do in what period of time, at least the way we've constructed our engine right now. So maybe that's something for the future. But cool. Um, but there's, you certainly couldn't play this entire game through at 120 hertz. Uh, and you know what? Not enough of us on the <laughs> development team have 120 hertz TVs to really prove it out. I think. Um, oh yeah, that's an that's actually an interesting point. I guess is. I've heard this before as well. Like it's difficult to test certain features uh, because certain like TVs with 120 hertz support or like VRR support and such, they're not that common yet. So, and if the and we're all team at, doesn't we're have all it, at home, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're all at home and people are in a desk in a closet and they're like, I can't put a 60 inch TV <laughs> on the wall in my closet because <laughs> that's the one I can get. So, um, certainly it'll be something fun to think about in the future. For now. Honestly, the 60 frames per second modes add a ton to the game for a lot of people. Oh, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. a really fun way to play the game. So Really good stuff. Uh, and also appreciate all the options like, uh, you know, you can toggle motion blur strength. You can turn off chromatic aberration and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, mean, I know the community appreciates that kind of stuff because there is a lot of variation in terms of what users prefer. I like it on, but, you know, it's nice to have the option. Um, so I guess, you know, it's interesting then. So the, the game was in development for a while, of course, and um, I guess, you know, while we're still on ray tracing, I am wondering, like, at what point in development were you guys like, oh, okay, we can actually do this ray tracing? Because looking at a lot of the assets and such, I really got the feeling that the artists had created a lot of these things with that kind of idea in mind. You know, perhaps more than Spider-Man Miles Morales, where it really felt like the like this was designed to be viewed with ray trace reflections. So when we started development, we knew we were making a PS5 title, and we also sure. knew sort of 
uh, emotionally or something, even before making it work. <laughs> we're okay. We're gonna do this game with with ray trace, but like, let's do it. Um, and I think that was maybe a little bit premature. I think we had different <laughs> expectations at different times for how pervasive we'd be able to make it. I think the initial plan was um, the main character and maybe the enemies, like they can reflect and then we'll just overlay them on top of other probes and stuff, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it, but that, that's <laughs> sort of where everything started. And um, I think it was, you know, it, even if it wasn't making them for ray tracing, I think it was making them with um, better practices around um, physically based materials. Oh, right. Um, you know, uh, better cognizance of the value that has when you do it the right way and when you do it very carefully. And so I think that's actually why the game can look pretty reasonable when with the ray tracing is off too. So yeah, unless that's you true. run into some other it scenarios. Does. But you know, some if we make all that content with the right um, rigor around um, those components of it, then a lot of these effects when you do them carefully and correctly um, just just look really nice and work really well. Um, I especially loved, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but the game does use a lot of curved glass and there's some really neat effects in there, like uh, simulating, for instance, the way the reflections flip. Like, how did that come about? I mean, I I'm curious how that was implemented in a way, or was it just like a thing where, oh, wow, okay, if we apply it this way, it works? Uh, because it's a neat attention to detail that I don't recall seeing in a game quite like this ever before. Uh, that's physics. I, you know, we had, <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> we had a bug one day that was, I think there's a shot of, of Rivet and Clank in the cockpit of her ship and looking out. Maybe it's when the UI comes up or something. Someone found a frame and they said, hey, this is weird. Um, Rivet's <laughs> on the left, Clank's on the right. But then in the reflections, um, Clank is in front of Rivet and Rivet's in front of Clank. And that doesn't seem right. And we were like, yeah, that doesn't seem right. And then you know you look through the code you realize it's like looking into a spoon uh oh yeah yeah the reflections are bouncing in a way where no that's actually correct you're looking at the glass in front of rivet that bounces to hit clank you're looking at the glass in front of clank that bounces left to hit rivet and um yeah i guess that's how it's supposed to be maybe some uh, people will think it's a bug but <laughs> <laughs> i also liked i noticed that in nefarious's cockpit as well at the beginning which also highlighted another thing that i love there's that scene at the intro where uh, when you first meet him, you can actually, it zooms on in this cockpit and you can see the reflection of all the cars behind you. Well, the air cars flying around in the sky and everything, which is a really dramatic sequence. But then when you play it without ray tracing, you see, you don't see any of that. And it, it was really that effective moment where you can kind of appreciate like how much this really can add to the presentation. The glass, you know, Nefarious has a big glass dome on his head. Yeah. Um, that thematically stretches through so much of the game because, you know, there's a whole city in his image yeah. later. Um, <laughs> like this cockpit has it, and it, they all look great in the reflections, but they're also a huge pain to deal with, I would say. Transparent blended materials that need to reflect other blended materials. Um, when The more curved your surfaces are, the more divergent the rays are that you bounce off them. So the more expensive they are when you go to compute them and uh, and it's really it looks really cool thematically but man that was that was a huge pain to optimize around i, sure. I kind of spotted the worst case scenario is when you actually look through the glass of his cockpit you're doing the ray trace reflections on the cockpit but his helmet also has the curved glass which you can't really uh do ray trace reflections on both at the same time just due to the, uh, the there's potential there down the line maybe but that seemed pretty complicated and there was kind of a if you see from this image here you can kind of see how it worked out in the end and i mean how often did you guys run into cases like this where you're like oh shoot like if we have too many you know reflective surfaces stacked up we have to automatically you know call the reflection from this one or just like how, how is that working for you glass and glass behind glass and <laughs> reflections on the glass that is always the hardest thing to deal with and i'm not sure we ever got it quite right. Hopefully it just doesn't look bad. No, it look it looks fine. It's just uh I always think about those difficult scenarios and you know, of course the Hall of Mirrors effect would be cool. There's not really any situation where that would occur here, but um that's it that's an especially demanding use of ray tracing that requires many bounces <laughs> I think to achieve. But that's cool. But anyway, beyond ray tracing and the SSD stuff, another thing that I think really impressed me 
and everybody else from the looks of it is just the sheer level of detail on display uh from the main characters to those little insects that i highlighted to like you know the shell casings and all of that i am you know but there's been a lot of discussion about that some people are like oh why would they waste so much time you know making these super detailed things that you never see and then others like you know that's what defines it as a next gen game i would love to learn more about just like from the beginning like the process the artists took here to create so many super high detail assets and how that kind of fit into your development of the game i think there's a little bit when we started which was um well we don't know how powerful this thing's gonna be <laughs> um hey artists just go have fun and make some <laughs> make some crazy <laughs> stuff um and you know we if we knew that storage wasn't going to be as much of a constraint storage speed that gives you some freedom to make some high detailed stuff yeah it's true you, some of these things you might only see if you pop open photo mode and and zoom into it but it also frees us up to know hey if we make a cinematic and we want it to be from a perspective where there's an object in the foreground like it's going to be of a quality that um supports that sure or um you know, you, you can you can imagine that you can you see those cutscenes in games sometimes where it's a slow slow pan to something and a, a stapler comes into the foreground or something and you're like mm. that stapler wasn't meant to be uh, take up a quarter of the screen <laughs> and so uh, that that freed us up a little bit that way and I mean honestly we love supporting photo mode and players who use that too and just knowing that you can sort of get weirdly close to stuff and have it look really good is a nice way to show off. Um, the level of detail that's actually that's an that's interesting taking you, you taking photo mode into account when building the game assets uh that's i guess that's kind of a more recent development with the popularity of that that kind of feature it's always the pressure of uh i think for artists making assets is well, what is this going to look like if someone zooms up to it in photo mode? all right we can't do this for every <laughs> asset we can't think about that for you know the drink cup on the no. in the trash pile on the sidewalk but um you know, it, it's nice to do for some fun things and the character team especially um, does some really awesome quality sculpts that they pull in. So that's where things like bugs or, you know, of course the hero characters, we put a ton of detail. Um, and actually that, that's something I think a lot of people um, were confused about because, you know, you can zoom in on photo mode on like Ratchet or Rivet and the detail is absurd. Um, but to me, it looks like it has a, you're using a very, very effective LOD management system that sort of preserves that detail correctly, depending on how many pixels per, you know, the screen is being used up by that character at any time. Uh, maybe you could actually talk a little bit about how your LOD system works, like how you go from like the maximum detail to like slightly less detail and how it's being cut, uh, just to sort of clarify that. Yeah, okay, it's worth noting that we have the cinematics in the game are not using separate assets or, um, systems than the gameplay and, and this is partly so we can transition so smoothly between the two mm -hmm. uh, which is something we did a lot in the spider-man games and uh, we do a lot here it's really fun to end a cinematic and um you know have it go to player control and sometimes have the player not even realize that oh it's my time to do stuff you know um so it's all the same assets and it's all about yeah, when the camera's close, we're going to use some stuff that's higher quality. When it's farther, we're going to use some some other stuff. There's coarse textures have MIP levels that yeah. um, you can even let the hardware figure out sometimes the right the right MIP to use at the right time. Uh, and then for we have level of detail for meshes and, and models. As you get closer, we find the right thing to do. That's more by hand and making sure we've built those and tuned them the right way. Uh, other systems do it inherently. So the hair strand system is yes. one where, um, based on how close or how far you are, it fills in the right number of hairs to give the right level of detail, but without, you know, blowing out our, our render budget or how many tiny little polygons to put on. Actually, that's interesting. Like, let's say you zoom the camera right into one of those first strands uh, or like areas, like a tail or something like roughly, what would you say? Like how many like tiny triangles are being rendered when it's at its like say maximum amount there? Uh, I would say for Rivet's tail, there's, you know, 500 to a million polygons if you get high high detail hair in the whole thing so 500,000 um, to a million <laughs> yeah I think if you if you 
it's constructed as um, these control splines, right? So, right, sure. Um, if you looked at just what's authored, it looks pretty sparse. There's, some, I don't know, but hmm. tens of thousands, maybe low, low five figures, maybe high four figures, and uh, it's just about okay. The system knows where those control curves are and then fills in all the space between them with um, strands to, you know, to fill it out, make it look like the right puffiness. Is this a, a technical term? Does resolution actually factor into that at all? Or is this like, for instance, when you're using the performance RT mode versus quality mode, I noted that it seems a little bit less dense. And I'm just wondering like how that is actually determined from your side. You know, I think it's a combination of things like resolution and, and distance and, um, and just other factors. You know, there's some things between those modes that we tune slightly sure. to make sure we have the headroom to do things twice as fast. And I'm not sure for sure, but this might be one of those systems where we do that. Okay, that's really cool then. Um, so yeah, so yeah, the strand system is really cool. And then also, you know, that's kind of mixed with the typical shell texture effect just give like the more short, short fur, I suppose. Uh, but then also while we're thinking close in on the characters, I think one of the things that uh, was just striking was just the quality of the eye rendering. But also, you know, it looks like you guys actually have like that separate rig or something specifically to create the, the highlight on the eye. And this is, a, it actually sort of matches, I guess, more like the cinematic film from 2016 in that regard as well. Like, I would love to hear more about like, how you guys approached eye rendering because obviously there was all this push to get as realistic eyes as possible in spider-man and they look really really good but then you come to ratchet and you have all these creatures with huge eyes uh like <laughs> art artistically and technically like how we'll talk of, i'd love to know more about that so um in spider-man they're humans yeah for the most part nice um yeah they're humans, uh, mostly. and they have um <laughs> you know spherical enough eyeballs you know you they're not perfectly but that's how they all you know that's what we're used to looking at as people we look at people's spherical eyeballs we know how light bounces off of them and and propagates through them and things like that um and when we went to ratchet ratchet doesn't have massive sphere eyeballs that would be super weird he has you know they're kind of flat in the front yeah they curve around the sides um, and what happens is if you have a light up there bouncing off mm -hmm. those oddly curved, not spherical, <laughs> uh, objects, the highlights are in different places and he looks sort of lazy eyed. Oh, or, right. <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah. And so, um, we did a bunch of work to take eye highlights, or at least the lights when you bounce them off the eyes and make sure they come from directions where they... Uh, it looks symmetrical on his, right. on his two eyes, and it looks like an animator would animate it, or someone would hand draw it, or something like that. That's that's cool. I also noticed uh, th thinking of like animation work. Uh, you guys did a really nice job with the use. Uh, I guess it's like blend shapes or something to do like the squash and stretch of the characters, which is really interesting. Like uh, I guess there wasn't so much of that in Spider Man necessarily, but it seems like they you've really accentuated the animation here uh like as an upgrade from say like even the 2016 game we're definitely pushing a lot more in the characters well i guess maybe differently is a better term but yeah the faces need to be more exaggerated do different things um i think there's you know 300 different morph targets for say rasha rivet's face that we can know blend between at any time to give all these different subtle expressions on top of the rigging that's happening and so um they can get pretty emotive i think these last couple of games we've gotten to an awesome well i'd say the the, the spider-man ps4 titles as well but really really being able to display a lot of emotion on the characters faces and bring a lot of subtlety in the uh in the cinematic and storytelling moments that open some doors to you know tell those stories in a, in a more nuanced way. Sure, absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, aside from the characters, I do also want to talk a little bit about the, uh, just the general lighting that's going on here as well. Like for instance, you know, 
Um, the indirect lighting actually looks pretty good in this game, I feel. Uh, and it, I, I'd like to know more about sort of that voxelized structure you're using to sort of like figure out the different diffuse light color and everything and um, you know just how that's uh, evolved maybe over the years and yeah this is an extension of the big lighting system that we had in, in Spider-Man titles so we um, at, at a sort of fixed grids of points throughout the scene we um, offline do bakes of um, diffuse lighting contribution to make sure we get a bunch of bounces off nearby objects and and uh, can have some realistic lighting in there. Um, when we when we switch to working at home, well, even before then, I'd say for the for the uh, for the 2018 Spider-Man title, we were doing this on a render farm of you know however many machines right. that loaded the scene and did these full screen captures at every angle to make sure we were <laughs> you know doing lighting contribution. It took forever. And uh, especially when everyone started to work from home, you know, there was no way we were going to be mm. able to, um, uh, you know, support that workflow. Right. So yeah. one of our render programmers, um, Bob Sprintel, he he did some awesome work with um, a new system we have that sort of yeah voxelizes the scene, traces rays through it in effect to do that type of computation. You know, uh, a couple orders of magnitude faster so you can an artist can bake some lighting on their machine in an afternoon instead of farming it off to a, a, a cluster of machines overnight um right the end cool. result is still the same baked baked mm -hmm. grid of um diffuse contribution through the levels and that tech has stayed pretty constant because it holds up pretty well but yeah yeah in the future it could be really cool to to get into that real-time gi space you know yeah. what epic is doing is really great so definitely definitely Actually, though, you, you mentioning working from home, that's that actually could be an interesting topic here real quick is um, so obviously, I guess, due to the pandemic, you guys had to transition to work from home. And since that time, you've shipped two games, which is kind of amazing to consider. Uh, I'm sure some people would love to hear like any insights or like your experiences and bringing the whole studio to, to work from home and yet still managing to ship these two games. Yeah, it's uh been a crazy year <laughs> for everybody yeah. but for us as well um i'd say we had we had a bit of a leg up at the start as a studio because we have uh the, our north carolina office and we have an office in right. california and we had some employees who were spread out and so it wasn't totally foreign for us to suddenly be you know needing to communicate a bit over video chat or you know transmit builds around and that sort of thing um so and our IT department, you know, <laughs> did an awesome job getting everyone going. Uh, thank God for those guys. And um, yeah, I think it was a lot of, I, I think we were a bit fortunate that the, the place we were in those projects was, you know, somewhat supported by where we were. I think we had right. some, some mocap left to do on, on Miles Morales that we had to get creative about. And Ratchet as a project isn't one where all that stuff is as much of a, a, a blocker for production. We did send home uh, recording studio kits to all our voice actors oh. for all these games to make sure oh, they cool. could do all their stuff. And um, and a lot of a lot of creative work from a lot of teams around the studio to make sure we could still uh, make some progress. So, I mean, was the voice acting stuff, was that mostly done at home then like from for the individual voice actors or, or was there still studio time for them i think for this game i think for ratchet and clank every line of dialogue was recorded in a voice actor's home wow that's, maybe not uh, every i don't know that's, if i should that's, be that strong but I, right sure, certainly sure. It was that's pretty cool that's pretty cool I, I could not tell i mean you know that not that that's not a, not an uncommon thing or anything but uh it's really it really turned out well and the chemistry between the characters works out really well so it was super fun i know all of us in the technical teams had a blast picking through new <laughs> cinematics as they came in and came online and and uh you know for us getting to watch that stuff come together is always fun so actually continuing from there like we talked earlier about you know the lod stuff and you mentioned how you are doing those transitions from cutscene to gameplay this is one of my favorite things in modern games, and it's something we didn't see much for a while, but I've never actually really um, 
receive too much insight into how that works technically and like what it takes from your side to actually make that possible uh is there any sort of like oversight you can give about like how you're able to do these super high-end cutscenes, but then trans transfer directly into gameplay like bring all the logic into play like there i mean what's going on there uh our gameplay programming team's doing an awesome job working on all those systems that blend cameras into one another and have characters animation settle smoothly into you know gameplay states and things like that um and i and our lighting has to transition from a fully you know carefully authored cinematic rig into the gameplay environment right of course so you're probably like lighting the characters specifically for the cutscenes, but then it's got to transition right. to the game to the to the normal game lighting which is different exactly uh, yeah. every every shot has its own you know tweaked lighting and this lights here and i want sure, this much sure. depth of field of course and um i want the you know atmosphere to have this tint to it whatever all that kind of stuff i mean it's the same stuff you do with like real cameras honestly trying to film stuff positioning your lights doing all that stuff using the correct lenses uh that really turned out well and yeah all the post-processing stuff in this game again i mean a lot of the stuff showed up in spider-man but it's like really refined you know the bokeh depth of field effect is great uh, i love the i mean insomniac's motion blur i'm not sure what the secret is there but i guess going all the way back to sunset overdrive everything since then it's continued to improve and it's just i think the effect where it really hits the most is you know in the uh the desert planet i forget the name right now but there's those yellow things you latch onto with l1 and rivet quickly spins around on that and it's like without motion blur it just doesn't look the same but with it it's just this unbelievable looking display of uh uh of animation and it's just awesome <laughs> so i mean like how did you guys actually settle upon or like attack motion blur because fundamentally there's a lot of implementations out there but this one is is so exceptionally clean and the shutter speed by default is so uh expertly configured to like really convey that motion in a way that i, I really like it we always talk about that on df <laughs> but hey um it's you know it's been a somewhat foundational piece of the engine for a while i think it just yeah, put yeah, together yeah. around it knowing it, yeah it's not like it's not like we've revamped it dramatically between titles i think it, it comes from um we we make sure that for every pixel of the frame we know where it was the frame before we have you know as accurate motion vectors for everything as we can uh every effect we do we need to take that into account we added you know a different way of um animating uh, doing vertex animation on small objects and uh when you do that you not only need to say hey here's how every i need every vert to be in this place for this frame you also need to say be able to say and it was in this place last frame so here's how it moved and so you know in your g buffer you have this sort of or in, in a separate buffer but you have this notion of how everything has moved every frame can feed that all into the same system. So um, make sure when you occlude or disocclude other things that takes that into account. I think I think it's just a lot of careful, um, you know, careful rigor around every pixel and making sure that algorithms taking all those different cases into effect just the right way. I don't know if there's a magic to it. <laughs> I think it's no, just it's... being very, very careful and thorough about all of it yeah yeah definitely that's really good stuff uh well you know is there anything else that that you want to highlight that you're super proud of on this project we talked about the loading times we talked about well one tidbit i was going to throw in as you mentioned um fur and hair uh, that you know part of that system that's really cool is yeah, there's there's not just a fur shell and then a um you know some hairs in there as well it's because then you just see hairs sticking out of a fur oh, shell yeah, sure the, the fur can get groomed in the same direction. Oh. It follows those same control curves of the hair. There was a lot of work um, put into making sure that they blend into each other really smoothly uh, and cleanly. Oh so yeah, that's something cool about that fur that um, that really paid off well. Thinking of grooming direction, I, I, one thing I did notice uh, when I was replaying again in the opening level, when you're on one of those things moving around in the sky, as you fire your blaster, it seems like the shots actually arc 
with the sort of position. So like if it's tilting to the side, you see your shots sort of curve. Uh, is it like, I, I hadn't noticed that the first time, but it seems like that was like a kind of a slick trick there. There's a lot of weird stuff with <laughs> those moving platforms because, and there's a lot around player expectation that's super odd too, right? Yeah. If you uh, are on a platform hurtling through the sky um, and you throw a grenade, like it's probably going to more just whip behind you immediately. But that's no fun for gameplay. No, play. that's not fun. <laughs> project it forward to the guys that are up there. And, you know, um, and it's like, okay, this visual effect needs to stay on the platform because it communicates how the weapon is working. But this visual effect needs to, it's smoke. It needs to whip behind the platform and look like a real trail through the sky because that sells you the effect of the scene. And so it's a lot of flagging different objects to behave different ways when you're in those gameplay moments um, and making sure we sell the effect of you know, being sideways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and verse, um, letting the gameplay still communicate itself and and be fun to play. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, cool. Uh, I guess you know we've been at this for almost an hour now. I should probably let you get back to work, but <laughs> I appreciate you joining us here to talk about this uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Just phenomenal game. So very well done, everybody over there. Uh, but. Before we head off, is there anything you want to plug uh, going on in Insomniac or, you know, with your work that you've been involved in? I would love to plug uh, working at Insomniac Games. Uh, All right. I think uh, we've got a <laughs> lot of, we've got some open positions right now. We have programming positions and art positions and uh, positions on, on my team as programmers and technical artists. And so uh, if anyone out there watching your video is interested, check out our insomniacgames.com. Do check uh, it out. And take a look please definitely that's awesome uh but that's gonna do it for now so thank you so much for joining me for this one mike thank you for having me john this is great but of course and uh as always thank you to everyone who's watched the video if you enjoyed it you know be sure to like subscribe ring the notification bell all that good stuff as always uh and we will see you next time